Sage here for Calcine Media. Thanks for joining us. And please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. The European Union, NASDAQ and even the State Government of California have all mandates in place requiring a compulsory percentage of board members to be women or from a diversified group of individuals. Some progress is being made to achieve gender parity of females with their male counterparts in the workforce. With this year's Fortune 500 list of companies showing 41 women CEOs making the list, with even two being women of colour. This is a marked change from previous years. Karen Lynch, CEO of powerhouse health industry firm CVS Health, is the highest ranked female, and CVS Health has a monolithic market capitalisation of $268 billion and is ranked the Fortune 500's fourth highest company. And this is a record breaking ranking, taking over Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors. In 2014, General Motors was the Fortune's 500 sixth highest ranking company. However, General Motors comes in at 22 on the list this year. And this year's list not only has two women of colour in the highest ranked companies in the world, but it has a woman as the CEO of a major American bank. Jane Fraser, the CEO of Citigroup, is making history, appearing on the Fortune 500 list at the helm of the global banking major. Ursula Burns, the former CEO of Xerox, was the first woman of colour to make the Fortune 500 list as a female CEO. However, this year's list shows two female CEOs of African-American descent. A welcomed increase, and the USA has seen slow progress in the engaging of racially diverse employees, holding company board positions and CEO positions. And the existing progress seems to be on a basis of voluntary compliance. With only Ros Brewer from Walgreens Boots Alliance and Cassandra Brown Duckett from TIAA being the only two females of colour in the CEO position at the Fortune 500 companies, many are considering that mandated diversity targets could present a real solution to achieving a fairer representation of the community in management positions in the Western world. In 2014, the G20 summit leaders, led by Australia's presidency, agreed unanimously to close the gender participation difference that existed by 25% by the year 2025. In May 2017, Australia had seen significant improvement in the percentage of women aged between 15 to 64 years participating in the workforce, reaching 72% or 5.8 million women. And the biggest change since the beginning of the economy, as we know it, would have to be women joining the workforce, mainly due to the world wars when men were deployed to fight in the army and women were left to maintain the labour force. There are many economic benefits to increasing women's participation in the workforce, with an estimated $25 billion being possibly raised just by an extra 6% of women being added to the Australian workforce based on 2012 figures. If the G20 goal is achieved, this is 25% of the gender participation gap is reduced by 2025, the global GDP could increase by $5.3 trillion. However, the unmitigated pandemic put a huge buckle in the improving statistics with 2020 showing women's unemployment rising to 15.8% in April for the United States of America. It was found that women were more inclined to be stood down from their jobs during the economic downturn and even more so women of colour. And the Australian government has now put a focus on women for the existing federal budget. Implementing new superannuation laws in relation to casual and part-time workers who are mainly women due to their home care duties associated with childbearing. The former legislation required people to earn a minimum of $450 per month before being entitled to the superannuation guarantee. And this cap was based on a tax-free threshold at the time being close to $6,200 and now the tax-free threshold is much higher, closer to $18,200. And although not yet a law, it was decided on the 11th of May 2021 and will take effect from the 1st of July 2022. It is going to take a significant shift in the 
the dominant paradigm in relation to social norms and attitudes to work. And this will include implementing policy to reduce discrimination in the workplace, working towards a more fair workplace with equal treatment between men and women, as well as public awareness initiatives to upend the damaging and restrictive social norms. The Australian Government's focus on women in this federal budget is a start in the right direction to maintaining a high level of fundamental humanitarian protection in order to access maternity and parental paid leave for both genders, as well as the additional support for those requiring childcare facilities with three or more young children, those in violent interpersonal relationships and those suffering mental health disorders, which will encourage the easing of endemic issues that revolve around the family sphere. If you like this information, please like, share and comment on the video below and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos and for more information and regular updates, please head to the website calkaimedia.com. And this is Sage for Calkai Media.